morning. Thanks for coming in uh, early and uh, listening to our talk. My name is Mark Carlson. I work for Toshiba. This is David Slick. Yeah, from NetApp. And uh, we are active in the uh, object drive twig in SNIA. And this is a discussion of the standard that we released. It is a SNIA architecture and um, it's all uh, going to be explained here. So this is an actual SNEA tutorial, which means it's peer reviewed um, by, uh, and, and is intended to be vendor neutral content. Uh, there's a bunch of rules around it. If you present it, uh, you have to present the entire thing. You just can't cut a slide out of it. And just so uh, what we're going to talk about today is a new standard. Uh, it's called IP-based drive management. And it's um, really about IP-based storage drives, but the management of them and uh, leveraging existing standards uh, such as the DMTF Red Redfish standard. So what's an IP-based drive? Well, an IP-based drive is a storage device using TCP, typically via Ethernet, but that's not required. Uh, so IP-based drives can look like normal HDDs and SSDs in that form factor, and they can have uh, Ethernet port on the 8639 connector that is also used for SAS, SATA, and PCIe. Um, but they can also be virtualized uh, out of a system, and uh, or you can you can slap a little card on a SATA drive and put an Ethernet port on it. We've got some folks that are doing that kind of thing too. Any questions? Okay, thanks. So, <clears throat> IP Ethernet has been the primary data center connectivity fabric, especially. Uh, in the hyperscalers, uh, the Facebook, Amazon, Google, uh, Microsoft Azure. Um, why? It's cheap. <laughs> Ethernet's cheap. Ethernet will always be cheap because it's on the sort of commodity path, every new version of it, right? Um, it does reduce uh, complexity because everybody knows how to manage an IP network. And <clears throat> You don't need a special storage admin to run your storage network separate from the network admin that runs your network. So the other thing is data centers are increasingly virtualized and, and dynamic. So uh, Kubernetes, Docker, lightweight containers, this whole idea of, quote, serverless computing, whose name seems to change every couple of years. <laughs> And then uh, things like mobile applications, and then uh, dynamic scaling, which means not only scale out on demand, but scale back or in uh, when demand decreases. <coughs> so they have the following advantages. Storage services uh, that are provided by these drives, <coughs> you, can give, you can get to them from anywhere there's an IP, which is the internet, right? But you can also limit it to a local storage network or just in your data center <coughs> as well. So <clears throat> the clients, in, in this case we mean software, uh, can access these IP-based drives directly. <coughs> they don't have to go through a SCSI stack or a volume manager stack or a file system stack. Um, and that can reduce the overhead and complexity um, <clears throat> and, uh, and get rid of a lot of software that it could be buggy and needs to be maintained. <coughs> um, and then uh, the reason why we're using Redfish, for example, is it's scalable. Every device reports its own information directly onto the IP network, right? 
they also include links to other things like the enclosure that that drive is sitting in. So if you want to find the enclosure for a drive, you follow a URL. And now you're managing the enclosure instead of just the drive. From that enclosure, it's got a list of drives. And each one of those has a URL. And we'll show all that uh, schema here in a minute. And then multiple clients can access uh, IP-based drives without an intervening controller. Or you could be talking to the controller and it's a virtual IP drive as well. Next. OK. So if you want to move to IP-based drives, right, you're going to have a lot of endpoints. <laughs> right? So if you have a 50 petabyte system and it's got 10 terabyte disks or SSDs, that means you have 6,700 endpoints you're going to manage. Wonderful. Um, <clears throat> and they need to be directly managed instead of uh, sitting behind a storage controller. And oddly enough, this makes them more scalable because you're only interested in the drives that failed, for example. So you do a little query, it goes out finds all the drives that failed, and those are the ones that you're looking at and, and managing and fixing and, and upgrading kind of thing, right? So things like discovery, provisioning, configuration, health monitoring, uh, firmware updates, security, all that stuff is done directly to the drive without an intervening piece of software or hardware. So we discuss in this tutorial how they're managed. Okay, so as a device, I got an IP uh, drive. How do I connect to the network, right? As a manager, how do I discover and provision devices, right? How do I assign a device to some host and or piece of software? As a manager, how do I configure these devices? How do I monitor the operations in fault? How do I keep devices secure and up to date? Well, if we were to do all this from scratch, it would be a lot of work. So we don't want to we don't want to reinvent the wheel. So we looked around and found the DMTF Redfish uh, standard, which is now um, in its second or third version, major version actually. Um, <clears throat> but it has a RESTful interface. It has a fully featured and scalable device model. It has support for a variety of device topologies. And <clears throat> we're not the only one that's building on Redfish. Uh, Swordfish also builds on Redfish. There's a little booth out here. Go get your Swordfish stuff. Swordfish is more oriented, though, towards a system rather than an individual drive. So we've managed, we've leveraged uh, Redfish. Uh, here's the link to that. Uh, for managing individual drives. And of course, one of the advantages of building on top of Redfish is if you have a virtualized device, let's say you have a, a composite storage system sitting behind an IP gateway providing your storage through IP services, you may, for example, have RAID, a collection of drives, etc. What Swordfish allows on top of Redfish is even though you can manage this IP drive that looks like a single endpoint, through Swordfish, you can then look behind the scenes and say, okay, I thought it was one drive, but it's actually a composite, you know, RAID of six drives behind it in this configuration and set up to provide, you know, iSCSI out this interface and IP drive interfaces out this interface. It works very well together with the work being done by the other working group. Yep. So they're complementary. I right? want to manage a system. You want to drill down into a system. Then you're talking to our standard. So... <clears throat> There's a, a stack of stuff, if you, if you want to think about it, inside the drive, if you want to have an IP-based drive, right? So <clears throat> you can think of, of the thing that's responding to the queries and, and coming in from management software as a bunch of uh, device management features, right? Discovery, monitoring, configuration, notification, firmware, security, management. 
of these things, right? And then that sits on top of sort of network discovery and connectivity and all this, we're leveraging IETF, right? Why, why invent our own discovery and, and, and whatnot standards when we can just point to the IETF standards there? Yep. And these are widely deployed within uh, enterprise networks. These are familiar technologies. This isn't new infrastructure that has to be deployed. And that's really critical for both our customers and for people building solutions on top of this. We want to be able to rely on well-proven, reliable you know, infrastructure that doesn't require something completely new. So again, we're saving ourselves a bunch of work. <laughs> so, and then at the very bottom is your electrical and negotiation. Uh, for example, how, to, how fast does the ethernet go, right? And we, uh, we were looking at this for hard drives at one point uh, with uh, the Kinetic project. And, uh, and we, uh, we found that there was this uh, sort of no man's land between uh, one gigabit per second ethernet and 10 gigabit per second ethernet, right? And uh, at the time, you know, there's a 10x cost difference, right? And so you don't wanna put a, a 10 gig ethernet into your hard drive that really raises the cost per gigabyte you know, significantly. So we were looking at somewhere around two and a half or five gigabytes as an appropriate kind of hard drive interface speed. For solid state, you know, we want to go above 10, 40, yeah. 50. Uh, yeah, for flash, five. of course, it's a whole other world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we're working with the 802.11 group to, uh, you know, we sort of initiated this whole thing and they're, they're working on a, a a new uh, 802.11 AB or something, I think. 802.3 What Marty said. <laughs> 802. 802. <laughs> I want to repeat it for the uh, podcast. 802.3 CB. 802.3 CB. There you go. We'll put that on the next version. Of the <laughs> next. Okay, so what's the process? <clears throat> uh, so you're gonna connect up to a TCP IP network, or an ethernet network, right? You're gonna negotiate that speed uh, via ethernet. Uh, I forget what it's called, but there's a, there's a part of ethernet is to, to negotiate, do this uh, speed negotiation such that you may connect at the lowest level, one gig, and then negotiate up on both sides to two and a half or, or five gig or 10 or whatever. Uh, but that allows the, the drives have a standard way to talk uh, when they initially talk to each other, and then the switch and the, and the drive end up, uh, end up uh, uh, operating at the same speed. Okay, now I'm Ethernet connected, I'm at the right speed, now I need an IP address. So I go out to the DHCP server, and I not only get an IP address and a net mask and a router, which is what we think of it normally, but uh, it's also got a network time protocol configuration parameter as well. Because an uh, important part of management is knowing when things happen. And when needs to be accurate because you're trying to correlate you know, events with other things, right? So, so you want the drive to tell you that something happened uh, at this specific time, and that may be a result of something else happening at that specific time, and because this happened before this accurately, then you might be able to draw a conclusion that this caused this, right? So then we want to get a host name and uh, resolve names of other things around the network. We want to set the, the clock and, uh, and the chain of trust for that clock, for that time, right? Why is this important? Because this is one of the ways that a malicious person could get in and disrupt things is to change the definition of, of the system's time. Um, <clears throat> 
So at this point, as we go through all of this, you're an endpoint. You're a network endpoint. You're reachable, discoverable, and usable by the management software that's going to come in over this protocol. So <clears throat> there is a, a standard called Simple Service Discovery Protocol that would allow a Redfish management client to find all the URLs and endpoints that it wants to talk to. Um, and it uses HTTPS. Uh, which in this case means SSL version 3, I think. Um, yeah, or TLS. TLS, TLS, no. TLS 1, 1. 2. 2, 1, 2 or 1, 3. Yep. Um, managers connect to a well-known uh, URL component. So once you have the host name um, or IP address, you prepend that to this string here. And and every single Redfish endpoint will respond to that URL by definition, right? So then what do you do? Well, you can do a standard get, a standard put, standard post, patch, or delete uh, to the information that's in there. I can go get it, I can modify it, I can put it back, I can put back just a small piece, or I can get rid of the whole thing. The on-the-wire data is in what's called JavaScript object notation, or JSON format. And uh, it's not just vanilla JSON. Uh, Redfish uses uh, what's called OData to describe in you know, sort of a, a meta schema, if you will, for the information that's being conveyed. OData is an OASIS uh, standard. OASIS is a, a standards organization. And then that return JSON describes the resource properties, as we'll see uh, in a minute. That also defines a sort of resource map. Remember I told you to talk to the controller, you see the drives, but also power supplies, Ethernet switches, whatever you have, has a, a, a standardized schema for it in Redfish. And we leverage that as well. So if we, yeah, if we uh, drill down into this a little more, this is a, a visual diagram of a, a simplified model of what you'd see talking to a, a Redfish device for management. You, of course, have your root, your entry point, um, and one of the principles in Redfish is it subscribes to um, part of the REST philosophy, which is that your API should be self-describing in terms of what you can do with the API. So we'll be looking at, at some actual examples of what this would look like over the wire, but when you go to that entry point, that slash Redfish slash V1, it's going to describe not only information about you know, the top level device being managed, but also have links to other resources associated with that device. That could be links going upwards, i.e. I am a device in this chassis. These also can be links going downward. I contain an ethernet interface. I contain a block storage you know, resource that can be managed. So specifically looking at this, uh, there's examples of um, in Redfish, systems, chassis, and managers. And these represent the primary kind of, you know, concepts in the management model. You have chassis containing either more chassis or systems. Systems are the things you tend to manage, whether it's a computer system or in this case we view an IP-based drive as an example of a system. Because from one standpoint, you can actually look at these little IP-based drives very much like uh, Blade servers, right? It's got a CPU on it, it's got memory on it, it's got a network interface, it's got some level of storage. You know, it's, it's close enough that we can inherit many of the concepts already developed. So when we looked at how to fit this into Redfish, you know, we could have gone and created a whole new entity, but that would have duplicated 95% one of the powers of Redfish, because it's JSON, because it's extensible, 
is you can add your own fields. So we were able to add a few fields specific for the use case of an IP-based drive onto the existing system schema and be able to do this with way less work than it would be to have to create a whole new entity. And then finally, we have managers. You typically see managers in, for example, a chassis where you have a BMC, and then that's kind of acting in a supervisory role, looking at things like you know power and thermal issues, etc. So that fits with the existing model where you have kind of a, a side channel management system. So if you go down and drill down to the next level on each of these, you know, for example, systems have processors, they have disks, they have network interfaces, chassis have, you know, power and thermal aspects, and the managers typically, you know, doing your supervisory, you know, logging, etc. So what does this look like? Um, if I actually go and do a transaction. So, so here's a hypothetical device. We've got a IP-based storage device on, on the network. We don't know what it is. We don't know anything about it. All we have is the IP address that we've discovered via discovery protocol. So standard HTTP. You can go into a browser. You can use command line tools like curl. You can do this programmatically. You do a get to the address. You provide the right credentials. And you're going to get back a block of JSON. And the block of JSON has a series of fields. So for example, each device has a name. Each device has a version information. It has a unique identifier. These are defined in the Redfish standard. So there's a whole bunch of fields that are either mandatory or optional that a device can return. So I, as a manager, can then look through this to find, for example, well, how am I going to catalog this device? What name am I going to refer to it when I'm like keeping information about it, etc.? How do I present it to a user? What am I looking at? So you can discover, and because the, the data is self-describing, in addition, it's going to describe are there any resources under it? Are there chassis? Are there um, systems, managers, etc.? And, and Redfish de de defines um, just slightly under a, a dozen of these now. Um, and I'm sure more coming as it uh, extends out to manage uh, different types of devices. Um, but specifically what we're going to do is we're going to look at systems because we're interested in managing this specific system. So. Um, Redfish once again describes, here's how you go and look at systems. There's a systems um, JSON object in the larger JSON object, and that contains a link. How do you jump down to the system view? So when you go to the system view, you, know, you, you just went traverse to that URI I, that was specified and do a get for that. Now we get a list of the systems under management through that endpoint. Typically, if you went to a higher level view, like let's say I had a rack scale system, if I do that to the management IP of the rack scale system, I may see a list of all of the systems in that rack. If I've gone to an individual device, I see that system itself. So that's in case what we see here. This is um, system and it has an identifier of 43. Uh, you, you as vendors can specify your own identifiers. Uh, Redfish spells out you know, how all these identifiers are done. So I see there's one device in this case. And once again, it's self-describing. So I get a list of devices I can then traverse down. So I do a get to that specified uh, URI. And now I'm doing get for Redfish V1 systems 43. And now I'm seeing the details for that specific system. So just like we saw at each level, there's a series of standardized fields. Um, a little bit more information here than what we saw at the highest level, where you're saying these are the classes of devices, these are the lists of devices matching a particular type. Now we're looking at a specific device. So for example, um, you can have asset tags, you can have location information attached to this. And often in network management, this will all be populated during the provisioning stage, uh, where you want to, for management purposes, say, you know, this is in server room, you know, L72, this is in rack 14, uh, aisle 6, this is in U slot, you know, 12, etc. So different uh, organizations have different conventions for how to label um, and manage this. Some people won't use it at all. Other people will have this, so everything auto populates in nice, you know, visual diagrams showing where each devices are so that if a device fails, information you can get out of Redfish that device changes color in the map. Question? Is, 
So, so the question, the question is, is, uh, is there a system someplace that... What, what's providing this information? So, yes. So let's, let's take a step back and let's look at Redfish in the context of your data center. So your data center is typically viewed as a hierarchy of resources. What we've seen in terms of Redfish management is typically you have a, some sort of management system. You know, this, this is like HP OpenView, et cetera, something enterprise-wide, and this software aggregates up all of your information from your various devices. So that entity is going to provide an enterprise-wide or a, a site-wide view. And if that software is Redfish enabled, you can go to the IP address of, say, your OpenView instance, and you'll see everything for that. You'll see a huge long list of systems, a huge long list of chassis, etc. Now, where did HP OpenView or the equivalent software get that information? Well, it went out and discovered individual devices and individual chassis. So if I go to a chassis, let's say I, I build a rack scale system, right? If I hit the red uh, fish endpoint on that, I'm going to see my chassis and the list of systems in my chassis. And my chassis may have discovered that list by looking at individual IP drives in the chassis. If I go to just a specific IP drive, it's only going to know about itself. So the concept is, is that there's IP drive endpoints or other IP managed devices that are then discovered by a chassis that is then discovered by a management system and at each layer you only see what it's aware of. Did that so, answer your question? Yeah, yeah, no. Thanks. Got it. So we've got this various information. Uh, typically a lot of this is set by the you know, HP OpenView type system. So if I plug in a fresh from the factory IP drive, it's not going to know where it is. It's not going to know that it's in Cincinnati. It's not going to know, you know any of this sort of information. This is typically programmed in, and Redfish provides that mechanism. So Redfish isn't just about data collection. Redfish is also how you configure and how you add tags and specify parameters for managed devices. So you know, the HP Open view equivalent that sees this new device come in, okay, I know that's in Cincinnati, I'm going to add that tag. So when I rediscover, I know where it is. I may, and, and the classic example, uh, you know, your knock, you have all your view, you know, you're telling a person, you need to go in and replace this drive, you can click and you can set the identify, and that's an action, and then the little blue light comes on on the front of the drive, and you know you pull the right drive, as opposed to, you know, pulling the wrong drive. Um, so, uh, things like serial numbers, firmware revisions, etc. This becomes really important for a lot of maintenance tasks. There's a, uh, you have, you want to update the firmware. You can look at this collection of data and, you know, select star where version is less than this. Um, if you have, if you want to do a refresh and you have a certain generation of drive, okay, this one's, you know, time for it to go, you can immediately find across your entire infrastructure where those resources that match those criteria are, that specific, you know, revision of, of the drive. So this is really powerful and, and this is what we get in essence for free by adopting the Redfish standard. So if we drill down a little more, you'll notice that there's, for example, information about your, your firmware, there's information about the processors. This goes down quite a few levels. And if, if you're interested in this, I, I encourage you to look at the uh, DMTF Redfish website. They have a series of interactive mock-ups where you can say, okay, here's how a uh, Redfish managed device would look, and you can browse through the JSON. And, and this goes, this is quite detailed. You can find, for example, list of Ethernet interfaces. You know, just like we had, um, you know, you can see, okay, for each Ethernet interface, what is its negotiated speed? What amount of traffic? Your counters? All this information we would typically have to set up S SNMP. We'd have to have traps, etc. It can all be done through Redfish. So this is, this is very, very powerful. Okay, so. As a manager, what would you typically do? A uh, management system, I should say. Well, you can drill down through these JSON documents. You can auto-discover. And one of the big trends in data center operation is automation. 
especially in you know, hyperscale cloud type environments, you want to be dynamic. You want to just not have to worry. You don't want people in the loop. So with an IP-based drive, you can literally plug the IP-based drive in. It, can, it configures itself, connects to the network. Various systems discover that resource, can allocate that resource, and use that resource. So one of the goals here is to provide full programmatic ability for you know, hands-off automated discovery. And an example of a use for Redfish is, let's say you have different uh, systems that are allocating and using resources on the network. Because Redfish allows you to add tags, a software system managing the allocation of resources can add a tag to a given IP device and say, this is being used by the XYZ subsystem. And another resource will see that's in use by someone else and leave it alone. When the XYZ subsystem no longer needs that IP-based drive for storage purposes, it can clear that tag, which results in a notification to other, other systems that that resource is now available. So this, this is very powerful in that with very simple scripts, which is how a lot of these you know, ops-type systems are built, you can receive notifications, you can see resource allocations, you can build systems on top of this to do things that used to be a huge amount of work because you didn't have these sorts of open API interfaces all the way down in a standardized way to allow these, these functions. The first thing you do is write an adapter from whatever your model was to yeah. whatever the proprietary interface that the device manufacturer gave you. And, and that rapidly proliferates. Yeah, this and one is of why the, they, they restrict their buyers to only buying from a couple of manufacturers. Oh, at least two, right? <laughs> <laughs> and one of the exciting things about Redfish is there's a lot of adoption among server vendors, and um, it, it's definitely it's, it's becoming IPMI replacement, so we're seeing a lot of... Um, a lot of products out there that are supporting this. This isn't something that's just, you know, what we're doing here. This is a cross-industry initiative. And, and just as a plug, there are a series of, of uh, swordfish uh, sessions uh, throughout the day. If you're interested in this and seeing how this applies to storage system management outside of IP drives, I'd encourage you to go and, and attend those sessions and that'll talk about, for example, virtualization rate, etc. So we've got a great lineup today. That, that starts off right after the break. It's kind of like a mini swordfish summit uh, and it goes to the end of the day and finishes with a panel of actual implementers that are doing it. Okay, but getting back to IP-based drives, uh, we have a technical working group uh, within SNEA specifically looking at uh, IP-based drives. And we, as, as Mark mentioned earlier, we looked at this from, from top to bottom, recognizing that there's, you know, in our world, there's a lot of virtualized uh, systems. Well, what happens if you want to build these IP-based drives, things that look like the common form factor, but, you know, they're using Ethernet, etc. So we started all the way at the um, physical connection and worked all the way up to the management layer. And this presentation is primarily about the management layer. And here's a link to the um, IP-based drive management specification, which, uh, as Mark mentioned, is a SNEA technical um, architecture. And um, you can take a look at it. It's uh, primarily just a, here's how we pull in and our recommendations uh, for the various uh, standards. The uh, following Redfish services uh, we mandate. So uh, use of the account service. Uh, this is uh, for permissions. You don't, of course, want these drives out there just talking to anybody. Um, session management, chassis collection, manager collection, and the system collection. And we recommend uh, supporting the uh, Redfish update service. Uh, this is really powerful for firmware management. I could spend a whole hour just talking about firmware management in large-scale systems because this is actually a real challenge uh, for a lot of our customers. Question? Hey. Great hey. presentation. Thanks. Uh, a really easy one. Is there a concept of a whitelist where a control plane can push a whitelist of authorized readers or writers to a device? So the, so question, the, question, go ahead. the question is, uh, in Redfish, is there the concept of a whitelist where a manager can push a list of authorized users to a device to allow it to determine who can connect? And the answer is yes. And uh, take a look at the Redfish spec. There's a whole section there. Um, 
Different people are, are, of course, implementing implementing the model, whether it's a push-based model or whether it's a pull-based model. Um, they're both uh, thought about. So good good stuff. Um, and um, what we extended Redfish uh, in this standard to create a new chassis type of IP-based drive. And um, that chassis, IP-based drive chassis, should require, should support status, um, manufacturer model, uh, SKU, uh, part number, serial number, asset tag, and indicator light. And this is just kind of the basic table stakes that uh, we see uh, most of the participants uh, using. Indicator light, of course, being, you know, the blue indicator used to you know, pull the wrong drive. So the DMTF guys really did a good job. Yep. This is the only thing we asked them to change. Yeah, the identifier. <laughs> and that's so that when I go and, and list all the chassis types across my data center, I can find the IP drives based on the chassis type. Yep. Yep. And of course, you know, in, in your, your visual interface, that would define, you'd show it with a different icon or, or in the composite view differently. And um, each IP-based drive, because they have an, an integrated computer, right, you have to have a system collection, and the system uh, resource should, you know, well, in this shall, case, shall uh, contain <laughs> uh, management interfaces uh, for your Ethernet ports. And the computer system uh, resource itself, same thing, status manufacturer model, SKU, part number, serial number, asset tag, indicator LED. And That's a little blue thing on the front. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and they also um, shall have... A MAC address? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Sure. Because but that's at the Ethernet level, yep. not the IP level, right? Uh, yeah. Right. Well, as you get down to the actual network interface, that's where you would see the MAC address. Yeah. And so this is a, that's that that next level example. down under system. And uh, you shall have a, a drive entity, and this is where you talk about the actual storage part of it, and once again there's the mandatory properties. Um, there's a lot of other properties that you may want to implement depending on what you have. Um, these are just the ones we want to say, this is kind of the base level that everyone's going to want. And, it, and it's perfectly okay for you to add your own properties yep. for your own proprietary features. It, and the, the client won't understand it, but then you can sort of publish what those at, at new attributes mean, and now maybe those will be standardized at yeah. some point. It would make sense to do some kind of performance logging or latency logging. Absolutely. Yep. Anything you want. Yeah. And to give an example, let's say you have an IP-based drive that has the ability to segment itself into an arbitrary number of partitions. It's a 10 terabyte drive, but it can represent itself as 10 1 terabyte drives, each with a different IP address, each managed. Let's say I, let's say you had a hypothetical product like that. You would like then the IO determinism. NVM sets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You may you you can implement it in this in that you would then see when you go to the IP address of the drive, you would see ten systems. Well, create a system, destroy a system dynamically as needed as you want to partition this. But someone goes to the IP address of one of those individual, you know, drives. They're just seeing that subset, which is really important when you want to ver you know, se uh, segment up a resource for different tenants. You want to know the where leveling. Yeah, exactly. And okay. because each of them are going to have a virtual Ethernet interface, you can specify the VLAN for that. You can specify the QoS parameters, et cetera. So it's Maybe do where leveling just within that one NVM set. Yep. And and so then each MVM says is going to have a different number of total bytes written, those kind of parameters. Yeah, and then billing, and then if you want to have someone have virtual infrastructure where they have management access to that, you're not going to give them management access to your physical layer, but you would give them management access and credentials, back to your point, to that one virtual drive. So when you put this all together, what does it look like? Well, you know, you go in and you have the uh, the root. Um, then you'll see a, a list of systems, a list of chassis, and then those go and provide the information about um, the individual storage resource, the uh, processors, your network interfaces, uh, etc. 
So I encourage you to uh, take a look at the IP-based drive management uh, specification and also to uh, spend some time looking at Redfish um, and to look at some of the um, open source um, that's going on um, to allow you to very, very quickly uh, either talk to Redfish devices or implement uh, Redfish on uh, existing devices. There's also a whole series of, of resources out there about uh, IP-based drives. Um, SNEA.org, uh, Object Drives is the um, kind of umbrella uh, location. Uh, we have a number of tutorials. Uh, there's one from the Flash Management Summit a couple of years back where we started uh, doing this work. And there's a webcast where we talk through this, so that's for more more details, and the DMTF has a bunch of resources as well. Uh, that second link there where you go DMTF slash redfish slash v1, use the um, uh, entry point. Uh, so remember, well, this is the root. Yep. And that part of the URL. That's a so, mock up. So DMTF is acting like one of these devices. Yeah. <laughs> and um, definitely appreciate uh, you coming today. Any questions? Back it up. Question. You might have already covered this because I got in a little bit late, but what actually runs on the host side to communicate with the drive? And so the question want. is, what actually <laughs> runs on the host side to communicate with the drive? So Traditionally, we've had drives sitting on some sort of dedicated storage fabric. It's something on a fiber channel or, you know, et cetera. As we see more and more devices moving over to a TCP IP based connectivity, we've seen, for example, iSCSI as an example. These drives could be providing NFS or other you know, SIF services. They could be providing um, proprietary um, so, uh, storage protocols. They could be providing a key value store, uh, et cetera. Ultimately, this is a management standard. So we're agnostic to what storage service is being provided. You could even have an IP-based drive that lets you load your own operating system and run your own storage software on it. That is up to the vendor that's selling these IP-based drives. We, we do talk about that sort of stuff a lot in the working group, but separate from the management side because we wanted to compartmentalize that so regardless of when someone was selling a drive or a system that was iSCSI or key value or, um, or other, you know, NAS, NFS, etc., we wanted this management specification to be broadly applicable. So There's some um, open source at the open source links, right? Go look at those for a Redfish yeah. client that, that you could cut and paste for them from your own application. Yeah. And keep in mind, you could have several different applications going into this one device doing different aspects of management, right? Your security manager could go out and secure all your IP drives. And then your uh, asset management would go and discover them and your, right? So that, those kind of things. A health management failure, failover, you know. Uh, uh, back on the previous comment Dave made, there's new work going on in uh, NVMe to put uh, NVMe over TCP IP fabric uh, spec in place. And so your NVMe drive might attach in the future to an Ethernet network, uh, put TCP IP on top of it. And, and Here's a way to set. manage it. Or let's say you uh, want to put converged Ethernet on your drive, right? And talk NVMe over Rocky, for example. That doesn't, just because you're not using TCP IP in the data path, doesn't mean you, can use you can't use TCP IP in the management path, right? If you're thinking it's going to be way too expensive to put TCP IP on there at the speeds that the drive is capable of, just use it for your management. The TCP IP stack is only for the management. There's Ethernet interfaces where they all connect, right? Yep. Is there any performance information in the Redfish scheme, I believe? So the answer is somewhat. And Redfish more provides a place for you to specify performance information rather than mandating that. 
Um, once again, it's, it's extensible. When you go back and look at that JSON, you can add your own fields. Um, as far as I know, there's been a little bit of discussion about that in Swordfish Group. Uh, if that's an area you're interested in, I encourage you to get involved with the standards, uh, with the, either DMTF or with Swordfish. Um, and we're absolutely open to looking at standardizing that sort of information. As, as the various data path technologies, like I mentioned, yeah. shake out, and get implemented in IP drives, those performance numbers will be specific to Rocky or specific to TCP IP or Fiber Channel, whatever. Or NFS. NFS, yeah. iSCSI. So, so at this point, it's a little bit too early to go off and standardize those before we have somebody come to the SNEA group and say, hey, I'm doing an iSCSI IP drive. I want to add some iSCSI performance parameters, iSCSI configuration parameters. Then it makes sense to go off and standardize those. Other questions? Okay, do check out the Swordfish this, uh, Summit, Mini Summit. Uh, you, will, you will get a very deep dive into both Redfish and Swordfish and, and hopefully paint the bigger picture. We're just painting this little picture in the corner here. <laughs> They're going to paint the big picture. They're going to talk about managers. They're going to talk about the, uh, the uh, latest innovations that they're doing in this new standard. All right, well, thank you for coming. Thank you.